Gentlemen, behold, Freedom Unleashed. Yeah, this is literally the Freedom Unleashed CPU from Sci-5. It's a RISC-V CPU, and it's open source, and this is big news. Uh, you can get a RISC-V board like this today to experiment with. You know, Debian Linux is basically fully operational. And this dev board has gigabit ethernet, USB, and micro SD slot. We've got eight gigs of uh, onboard RAM with error correction. This is a quad core 1.6-ish gigahertz CPU on a 28 nanometer process. It also has this uh, high speed expansion slot on the back, which will let you interface with, well, whatever you want to. If you want to develop, you know, PC type applications, there's an FPGA powered board available from Micro Semi, Micro Semi, whatever, that will give you USB and M.2 and PCIe expansion. You can run Quake 2 on this thing and it'll run pretty well at that. Now, at the end of the day, is this just another embedded CPU? What's the news here? You know, surely this is a glorified Raspberry Pi or a Tinkerboard or Oodroid or Latte Panda or something like that, right? Well, you know, there's this whole RISC versus CISC debate that I really don't want to get into. Modern CPUs are really, they're just stupid complicated. And it doesn't always make sense for applications that these those CPUs might be used for to, to target that. And so at the end of the day, the architecture doesn't really matter. And it doesn't matter for architectural reasons, at least. And I'll explain that in a second. What you have to understand uh, is that the next breakthroughs are likely going to be around custom silicon. You're probably already a PC enthusiast. And look what's happening around you. Gains in x86 have been around adding more silicon for things like H.264 decode and vector units and AVX 512. Not really improvements to the base x86. You can only do like a memory copy so fast. And there's lately been AMD Zen, which is an entirely new micro architecture, but it took a lot to get that right and compatible. Now look at NVIDIA, the new RTX graphics cards, they have an insane amount of silicon. Look at the shaders and the vector units, you've always had those, but now you've also got tensor cores and lots of other stuff in these giant pieces of silicon. You know, finally, after decades of Moore's Law, the lowest hanging fruit really is custom IC design. But custom IC design is not accessible nor is it really standardized. I mean, we've got everyone who wants a custom IC reinventing the wheel with like a machine learning accelerator or memory controllers or, you know, th but those are really the bog standard components of a system on chip. So what do you do? It's like, well, inner Sci-5. You can sort of Lego some stuff together. Now, there are field programmable gate arrays, FPGAs. You may have heard of these. These are cool because you can write a piece of software that configures the hardware inside an FPGA chip, and then the FPGA will behave exactly like a custom circuit. So you can even do a custom CPU this way. Uh, the best example that I can think of uh, that you might be familiar with is the FPGA module in high-end NVIDIA G-Sync monitors, like the one from ASUS. The time to get that FPGA implemented in custom hardware was just too long and NVIDIA's G-Sync partners like ASUS shipped a $400 FPGA in their displays. And you mean to tell me there's no ecosystem for rapid development of custom silicon? And we shipped a finished product with FPGA? No. And that's why ASUS and NVIDIA are shipping a $400 FPGA module in consumer G-Sync. Now, no, don't get me wrong, FPGAs are great for prototyping and experimenting, but they should definitely not be in mass-produced products. This type of thing is a possible business opportunity for Sci-5, and that's probably why the NVIDIA is a partner of Sci-5. Now, if you want a custom 16 nanometer IC, sure, got $50 million laying around, that's about what it costs. Look at what AMD does with their Zen CPUs, because they've been kind of open around it. They fly around the world twice, basically, from fab to binning and packaging. It's around the world to the US, China, Taiwan, Germany, partners like Global Foundries and TSMC. It's just not a simple operation at all. And, you know, AMD is a relatively small company compared to NVIDIA and Intel. Now, what if you could pick and choose IP components from several vendors online and, you know, sort of a la carte your way to a CPU for industrial, you know, whatever your industrial application might be, and you could get it in a matter of weeks or months. Well, that's, that's Sci-Fi's vision, as I understand it. And it's also open source, but, but open source, what sense does that make? Why would you, why, why would you open source all of this complication and proprietary stuff? Well, open source 
uh, does actually make sense. But you're gonna have to peel back the layers here a little bit to understand what open source really means in this context. So let's talk about Amazon for a second, because you know Amazon AWS and their use of open source. I guess AWS is redundant. Amazon Web Services, I mean, look at it. Jeff Bezos' moneymaker is Amazon Web Services. It's not you buying books online or anything like that. AWS was built with open source tools and a lot of improvements to open source tools have come from Amazon. AWS just wouldn't have been possible without the community plumbing of open source software that's powering all of that infrastructure. One might say that Amazon also reinvented the whole infrastructure as a service business model because of the kinds of things that they made available to the public through their API and what eventually became Amazon Web Services. AWS enables a whole new kind of business. Just a handful of people could launch an app with millions of users. AWS under the hood, uh, or AWS is under the hood of a lot of success stories in software startups for sure. So Sci5 thinks they can accelerate new product development and hardware the same way that the AWS API software stack has been transformative for those businesses. You can design a new CPU, but automatically be sure that it's compatible with say Samsung's RAM ICs because you've used known good and tested IP when putting together your system on a chip with Sci5. So how do you put your own custom SOC together? Well, Sci5 is putting all of that on the web. It's mostly a GUI chip designer where you can pick the components that you need, you know, machine learning or vision processing or high-speed interfaces, memory controllers for whatever your particular application is, you name it. You know, whereas if you think about AWS, it's now possible for a small company with just a few employees to have millions of users at a billion dollar valuation. <coughs> so, so now we've got commercial projects that can launch the same way and you know have this insane compatibility with other companies' IP offerings. Not just you know small time people, but RAM compatibility and AI accelerators and vision processing and all the bleeding edge stuff with a little bit of custom silicon. And since silicon is not really getting much faster for compute, Sci5 wants to be at the center of this new low friction and fast ecosystem that accelerates custom chip creation with RISC-V at the computational heart of the platform. So think of it, RISC-V is kind of like the kernel that's gonna bring together this worldwide IP from many different companies the way that the Linux kernel brought together all of the GNU utilities to really make something special. So RISC-V offers the base computational instruction set architecture, which is actually pretty old and very robust, but it can be extended for your custom ICs, almost like Lego, with other IP from other companies, even your own custom IP, that's all your own and you know totally you, because it's all open. If you run into a problem with whatever custom, new, awesome, innovative thing that you're working on, you have all of the tools and transparency that you need to understand and troubleshoot the situation. Now, Sci5 has a lot of partners in this, and I mean a lot. I mentioned NVIDIA, but also Google and Western Digital and over a hundred more companies, giants in the industry. And when you, you know, look deeper for a sec and look at the open source stuff that Google has been doing with TensorFlow and NVIDIA with NVDLA, the deep learning thing, then it maybe starts to make more sense why Sci5 is doing this as an open source thing and why those companies are opening their IP in hopes that it will be incorporated into future products. And I'm given to understand that there are folks right now today working on NVDLA on RISC-V right now. It really is an open source CPU. For me, and this is key, in the end, it doesn't matter what the architecture is. What matters is the infrastructure around the CPU. For Linux, x86 doesn't matter. It's everything around x86, the peripherals, the support, software, compilers, all the other people. But Sci5 gets that, which is why the partners in the ecosystem is so important to them. They need all of the support and all of the people doing the adoption. It's not about the instruction set, not really. So don't fixate on the instruction set. It's how easy this is going to be to adopt and use and get up and running in your product. If the RISC-V infrastructure makes it easier to adopt, easier to get products to market, and easier to support products in the market, it will be very quickly pretty much everywhere. Kind of like Linux, and, and I'm sure like Linux, we'll see you know the year of the RISC-V desktop. No, I mean, I don't think we're gonna see that anytime soon. But also like Linux, it doesn't mean that we won't start to see it pretty much everywhere else, because Linux has pretty much taken over the world everywhere. And it is a grand vision of the future of embedded and customizable compute that Sci5 has. And if they're right, they are poised to be the next Amazon of this niche, niche, whatever, as they reinvent how this works in a whole ecosystem. Now, next video, we're gonna take a look at this 
expansion board for micro semi and some of the other things we can do around risk 5 so this is an fpga it gives us an interface for the high speed you know chip link thing and then we've got pci express and m.2 and usb and sata and all sorts of fun things and this plus a graphics card is what we need to play quake 2. that's been a quick look at risk 5 and my impression after playing with it for the past several weeks over the over the holiday it's exciting it's an exciting time i you know there's they're ambitious oh they're ambitious but uh it's exciting it's fun it's it's a new thing so uh if you have any ideas or stuff you want to try or run some benchmarks and do some stuff i mean benchmarks aren't really all that super interesting because you know how fast do you really need it's like it's not about how fast that's not it's not what we're talking about here but uh, anyway, I digress. I'm gonna go hang out on the level one forum. And so if you want to come and gush over risk five uh, You should come to the level one forums. I'm Wendell. I'm signing out and I'll see you there